Okay. Hey, thanks for hanging in there with me. It's getting late, and I'm going I'm to try to make this quick. Um, how'd you like to have that guy as a next door neighbor? Uh, <laughs> wondering what he's doing in the backyard, right? Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm that UL guy who got fired for questioning the official investigation that my company was participating in producing with NIST. Uh, I'm also the co-editor of the Journal of 9-11 Studies for the last 10 years. And uh, more not notoriously, I'm uh, the author of a book um, that names new suspects called Another 19 in the Crimes of 9-11. We're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about um, a path to 9-11 truth and justice. And I'm going to ask you to participate uh, afterward in uh, conducting an investigation. So um, I liken the path to 9-11 truth and justice from where we are uh, to, like, to uh, being like crossing a raging river. And there are all sorts of obstacles to go from our current state of war and deception in the world we live in to uh, a world of 9-11 truth and justice where we can mitigate the wars and, uh, and reduce the deception in our lives. And the, the obstacles include emotional ones. And, and John mentioned some of the institutions that we would have to say uh, uh, failed us if there is a great deal more to learn about 9-11. Universities, the government, the media, it's hard to go there. A lot of people say, I can't go there. Uh, so that's the emotional obstacle. There are social pressures. We, uh, those of us who have already spoken out about 9-11, we lose family and friends, uh, unfortunately. Friends first, hopefully, and few family, but uh, that does happen. There are forces working against us. Propaganda from the media, people who uh, pose as true seekers, but yet intentionally disrupt what we do. Um, there are psychological factors that we have to deal with. And uh, uh, Fran Schur from Colorado was mentioned today as, as producing a video. Uh, that she did a good job of, of explaining cognitive dissonance and some of the things that people have to overcome. And there's a lot of legal hurdle, hurdles and uh, resistance uh, from authority. So in a way, all of these things represent the power of 9-11 truth. Uh, because we can use the, 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 I guess the phrase is the catastrophic and catalyzing realization that 9-11 was a lie. If you know that phrase, that comes from the project from New American Century. But I use it uh, in that when we realize that 9-11 was a lie, it, it reveals the deception in our lives. And uh, we can also, um, I think what we really need to do is we need to uh, create a path across this raging river in a way that our fellow citizens can follow us. So one, one step that people have taken in the past, and uh, a lot of people here have been involved in, including myself, is uh, taking the step of raising awareness about 9-11. So if you've seen uh, the World Trade Center evidence like you've seen today, you may want to go out and raise awareness and call for a new investigation. Um, one thing about this step is it's a big jump for a lot of people. It's a big jump and uh, it, it's not very secure um, because of the, the challenges that I spoke about. People uh, oftentimes can't jump that far and then they don't know where to go from there. They don't know how to go forward. So we need to give them something more to get them to a safe place, or a place at least where they feel more secure. And um, I think the first step is that a smaller step can be taken, and that is to realize the official accounts are false. This is actually the first step that I took. So I was fired for pointing out that uh, NIST test results contradicted their, their uh, conclusions, that the official story was false. When people really look at the official stories, and, and you've seen a lot about the NIST reports today, but um, if you look, look at the 9-11 Commission report, you also realize that that is a completely or nearly completely false story. Um, 
And one way you can see that is that their charter was to present the fullest pos possible accounting of the events of 9-11. And they did nothing like that. They omitted a, a great deal of the testimony that they received. They, they omitted uh, the testimony of Secretary of Transportation Norman Moneta, who said that the vice president was uh, maintaining orders about one of the planes as it was coming to Washington. The testimony of Sibel Edmonds, the FBI translator. Uh, William Rodriguez, the, the uh, World Trade Center janitors, who said that explosions were going off in the buildings. Um, they created an outline, the 9-11 Commission leaders did, for the report before the investigation began. And they kept that outline secret for the 9-11 Commission staff. But one thing that really brings it out to me is that the, the report ultimately, the 9-11 Commission report, was built on two things. Torture testimony, for which there is no evidence any longer because the CIA destroyed the video evidence, evidence and, and lied about its existence. And the other thing is um, classified cables and memos from the CIA and the FBI. So that's what really uh, built the Nylum Commission report and none of that can be validated. So it's really a false story in many ways. We can still do a lot here as citizens to point this out. So people uh, may know the NIST report is huge and, and the 9-11 Commission report, most people haven't read it. If you read through it and you ask questions, you'll be able to find more in, uh, ways in which they were concealing evidence and lying to us. So this is an important step because it, it really is firmer ground when you realize that the official account is, is false, I think you feel a little bit stronger about that fact, because you know it's true, it's false. Um, and then the current state kind of fades away. That leads to raising awareness and calling for a new investigation. And I've done a lot of that, and I think a lot of people here have from what I've heard over the last day. Um, you know, we've organized presentations and events. We've done simple things like tabling at the farmer's market, producing books and movies and so forth. And we're always doing this kind of fighting against a couple of things, the propaganda, uh, the intentional disruptors, and also the inertia. You know, there's a lot of inertia. People don't want to change. They need a reason to change, and usually they wait until they're suffering a great deal, and then they change. Um, so hopefully we can lead people um, to change in small steps, and that's what I'm trying to explain today. Uh, we need to continue to fight to raise awareness. There's no question about that. We need to think about the type of investigation we're calling for. So. The organization Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, the petition focuses on the U.S. Congress and calls on the U.S. Congress to uh, conduct a truly independent investigation with subpoena power focusing on the World Trade Center. So that's, that's I think, important to do. Of course, there have been a couple of U.S. Congress supported investigations, so maybe we look, can look in other ways. The, there are groups in New York City that have um, called for an investigation of Building 7, and they've generated tens of thousands of signatures. You may have heard of New York City Can, Remember Building 7. These campaigns were really great. They really uh, uh, did a lot of good work, but then in the end, those petitions were thrown out. Um, there's something I'm going to talk to you about a little bit more. Investigations by other governments. So you may know that uh, citizens of close to 60 countries died on 9-11. And uh, they have a right and a responsibility to investigate those deaths. But my main point here today, and I'll go to it, into it in a little more detail, is that we the people can conduct some or, or even most of the investigation ourselves. I believe we can. And I'm going to talk about how we can do that. We can continually identify questions that need answering and reveal that evidence, the answers. We can build a 9-11 case. And in doing so, we can provide other benefits. For example, we can potentially prevent another attack. And we can be better at investigating the next attack. 
There's been a lot of examples of good investigators. One here in Florida was a man named Daniel Hopsicker, who years, years ago, right after 9-11, did a lot to reveal that the uh, accused hijackers were very non-Muslim people. Um, and they did a lot of things that uh, didn't make much sense, and like hanging out at uh, airports controlled by CIA companies and uh, involving themselves in people who did drug running. So very uh, unusual things going on there. Um, my my co-editor at the Journal of 9-11 Studies, Grant McQueen, has done a lot of good investigation um, on 9-11 and also on the anthrax attacks. So um, he's got a great book about the anthrax anthrax attacks that kind of connects the two crimes, 9-11 uh, and the anthrax, anthrax attacks. Uh, the next step, though, I think, is just that sort of thing, revealing evidence for an, an alternative account. And it's important when we reveal evidence for an alternative account to focus on what it is we're trying to explain. And I think we need to go right to the events of 9-11. So we need to know who could have put explosives in the World Trade Center. If you've seen that, you saw this presentation, I think you know that's the, that's the question we need to answer. How did those buildings fall through uh, what should have been the path of most resistance? We need to know how four planes could have been hijacked when the hijacking prevention procedures that were in place should have prevented any hijacking. We need to know how the North American air defenses were disabled that morning and didn't intercept any of the planes. We need to know how the US chain of command failed us and, and most of our, our top leaders were missing or, or out, of, out of commission that morning. We even need to know with the accused hijackers how they were never caught when, if you look at the evidence, you look in detail at their their activities, they should have been caught very easily. Now, these guys were using their own names and their own credit cards and committing crimes. and It was just so obvious that they weren't caught. They were, in fact, protected. We need to know who was in position to do all these things and what kinds of technologies were involved. So Richard mentioned thermite. Uh, I would also point out that the evidence suggests remote hijacking of the planes. So we can look at companies that had that uh, technology at the time. Boeing, Raytheon, Cubic Defense Systems are companies that were testing and demonstrating remote hijacking of large airliners. But how do we go about investigating is what I would like to start to point out. And this is my process. And we don't begin with our conclusions. We don't say we know who committed the crimes of 9-11, whether it be an ethnic group we don't like or a country we'd like to blame or people we just think did it. What we do is we try to answer specific questions. And we can work on multiple questions at the same time. Reading the official accounts is important because the official myth, the official myth of 9-11 was part of the crimes of 9-11. It was something that was put in place um, over a period of years in order to serve the purpose of blaming others for 9-11. We need to search the available documents and the uh, web pages and, and books and, and I would really recommend people going to the library. A couple of instances where I, I really uh, found a lot of good information. Right after I was fired I lived in South Bend, Indiana and I just happened to have this great library at the University of Notre Dame which a lot of the students and alumni are not aware of, frankly. <laughs> but uh, I found a lot of old articles about the World Trade Center, a lot of good information about how the buildings were built. Um, in, in my, at my home in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, I went to the Indiana University Library. I found some congressional records that are of interest that I'll mention in a minute. Uh, testimony to the U.S. Congress about the air defenses. And do interviews. I've interviewed a uh, couple of people. I need to do a lot better on this. I've interviewed the vice chairman of the 9-11 Commission, Lee Hamilton, a couple of times. Um, an interesting guy who was behind a lot of cover-up commissions over a period of decades. 
I've interviewed the lawyer for uh, Abu Zubaydah, who was the first Al-Qaeda operative captured. And a lot of the 9-11 Commission story was built on this guy's testimony. Um, I recently had a chance to interview a Stratisec employee. Does anybody know what Stratisec is? It's the security company for the World Trade Center, Dulles Airport, where, where Flight 77 took off, United Airlines, Los Alamos National Laboratory, where uh, thermite, super thermite materials were being generated. So Stratisec is a, is a very interesting security company, and a, an employee of that company uh, contacted me, and I'm still trying to get back with them. But interviewing people is, is a great way to get to real primary evidence. Use FOIA requests, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Collect and store information. There's simple ways to do this. I'm really asking you to start investigating 9-11, aren't I? Okay, so that's what I'm doing. Start asking questions. I'll give you some sample questions here in a minute. Uh, collect and store the information. One way I've done that is to uh, save a draft email. The you know, title of the email might be Stratisec or something like that. Okay, and you learn things uh, by searching all the available documents, asking questions, trying to answer them objectively. Communicate clearly and objectively. So being objective is really important. Uh, if, if, you know, if you put out information about, for example, what happened or who did it, uh, you have to be really sure that at least um, how you're saying it uh, and how you were supported that contention can be, can be supported. It has some references behind it, has some real information behind it. So, um, so what guidelines should we use? This is important. So a lot of people say uh, in investigations you ask who benefited, and that's certainly true. Who benefited? If it was a murder, you'd say who benefited. In this case, a lot of people benefited. Uh, we could say uh, Shyam Sunder was mentioned. So I just, not that this is the case, but uh, Hindus in India benefited, right? Because Pakistan was attacked and, and oppressed. So are the Hindus responsible for this? I would say let's not go there. Let's talk about specifically um, not who benefited uh, as a starting point, but only as a, 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 a additional information. Another way uh, to look at it is foreknowledge. So a lot of people say, well, these people knew this was going to happen, so they must have done it. The fact is that a, a dozen governments, the intelligence agencies of a dozen governments, warned the United States that this was going to happen. So foreknowledge is not in itself enough to accuse someone, either that they benefited or that they had foreknowledge. Those might be supporting things. What we need to focus on is what happened that should not have happened, what did not happen that should have happened, and who was in position to do those things. And really the evidence needs to link the suspects directly to the crimes. So here's some example questions that I might ask, things I don't have the answer to. Maybe you want to write one down. You might want to use it as a template for another question. What did Stratisec do for United Airlines? I know what they did for the World Trade Center. I know what they did for Dulles Airport. We'll talk about that briefly. What can we learn about transponder or autopilot use on 9-11? A lot of people think the transponders were all turned off. The fact is that uh, for Flight 175, the second plane that hit the World Trade Center, the transponder was left on the entire time. For Flight 77, as the, as the uh, the plane was making its 180 degree, degree turn as, as it was being hijacked, according to the flight data recorder in the flight pass study, the autopilot stayed on the entire time it was turning around. And the autopilot turned off and turned on and turned off and turned on until it made that weird corkscrew turn. What role did a company called Phoenix Air Group play in air defenses? They provided unmanned remote control airplanes for a, an exercise prior to 9-11. Who was invited to this explosive disposal terrorism meeting at World Trade Center Building 7? If you haven't heard about this, I've written an article called Donald Rumsfeld and the Demolition of World Trade Center 7. It explains how Larry Silverstein apparently called a meeting uh, right at the time of the attacks 
with Army explosive disposal units and Navy explosive disposal units. And further investigation uh, revealed that the Secret Service actually was behind this meeting. So what happened? Who was involved and what was the agenda? What do the strip clubs and the bars and the other uh, businesses frequented by the accused men have in common? So these guys went to strip bars and drank alcohol, hung out with strippers and all over Florida <laughs> in Las Vegas. And uh, I think that's a legitimate question, a, a legitimate lead to follow. What, did those businesses have anything in common? What could cause the rare diseases of the first responders? I believe they are related to uh, thermitic materials, and I've written a paper on that. Uh, random question, what did the National Reconnaissance Office do that would cause its evacuation on 9-11, which happened, to facilitate the, the attacks? The National Recon Reconnaissance Office managed spy spat satellites across the country. Um, again, possibly related to remote control technology of airliners because satellites are related to that. Here's some useful sources of information for investigation. The National Archives, which uh, holds approximately a third of the documents that the 9-11 Commission used. You have to go there for the most part to get them. That's the, that's the downside. The upside is the 9-11 document archive at Scribd. Someone has gone down there for you and scanned them all in, a, a bunch of them, not all of them, and they're free at the 9-11 document archive on Scribd. The National Security Archive at George Washington University has something called September 11th source books. Lots of important source data there. 9-11 data sets is, uh, is a 9-11 activist website that has collected just terabytes, tons of data about 9-11 just for, for retention. Uh, and they've, they've uh, categorized those things. So 9-11review.com is Jim Hoffman's site, an old site that a lot of us have uh, gained a lot of great information from my journal of 9-11 studies, the History Commons Complete 9-11 Timeline, which is mainstream media news. Again, ret retained there, searchable. Uh, Google is a great place. Of course, it, it's a lot easier, a lot better if you know how to use search operators. If you just put in search operators for Google, it'll give them all to you and it'll allow you to focus your questioning and your, and your results. There's some news archives that of major news sources that, that are also very useful. The Wayback Machine will show you web pages that are no longer available. So, or even if you want to see a, what, what uh, you want to see what architects and engineers first page was that they posted, it, you can pull it right up there. Um, or the White House, um, uh, maybe the White House briefings. You can go to the White House, find the URL, put it in there. If they ever change, you'll be able to find out. Um, federal, state, and lo local FOIA websites. This is how to make a FOIA request. Freedom of Information Act request. We've gained a lot of good information from FOIA requests. Uh, from the USGS da data that Richard mentioned. Um, Ron Brookman, a, a board member at Architects and Engineers, uh, had a FOIA for NIST and found out that they would not release their data because it would jeopardize public <coughs> safety. Uh, we've uh, received environmental data that has resulted in peer-reviewed scientific papers and so on. Lots of very good information. And you can find, they'll tell you exactly how to do it. Sometimes you have to focus your, your requests. It takes a while. But I'll just tell you that if you put in 24 your requests, I'm positive that you're going to do more for 9-11 Truth and Justice than if you post 20 strongly worded things on Facebook. My, it's my example, okay? Uh, I think it's a better use of time, and it helps us towards revealing evidence for an alternative account. Now, we need to identify suspects and outline a case. This is, this is the precarious uh, thing that I've been doing the last couple of years. I, I wrote a book a few years ago. It's called Another 19, Investigating Legitimate Suspects. And uh, it's been very well received. It's not bedtime reading, but it's a lot of information. And I think you'll appreciate it. So if you're interested in this subject, I'm going to go over some of those suspects right now, just maybe half of them. 
Dick Cheney was the vice president on 9-11. He was there. We, put, we can put him right there in the middle of it. He was in charge at the White House at the Presidential Emergency Operations Center. He said the orders still stand as Flight 77 was miles away. That is, he was maintaining orders about one of the planes coming in to Washington. He tried to prevent an investigation. He failed to cooperate with the investigations once they started. A few years ago, he openly admitted he was making the decisions on 9-11, keeping the president away, and he made a decision to shoot down United 93. This was in the New York Times and totally contradictory to what he told the 9-11 Commission. This is kind of an, a, a strange fact that you may not be aware of. There's a company called Solomon Smith Barney an investment firm that occupied all but 10 floors of the 47-story World Trade Center Building 7. Uh, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld just happened to be on their advisory board. So it's a, you know, it's kind of a side piece of evidence, but something maybe that will lead to additional knowledge. He is also, of course, known to have lied to start several wars, including the Gulf War, several major lies to start that, and the Iraq War. This is uh, Dick Cheney's protege, if he has one. His name is Dwayne Andrews. He was Assistant Secretary of Defense under Cheney when he was Secretary of Defense. And then he became the Chief Operating Officer for a company called Science Applications International Corporation. That company provided oversight to the agency that on the morning of 9-11 implemented a secret communication system for the first time. Communications broke down across Washington in every way on 9-11 is part of why the, the attacks succeeded. This company created the US systems for tracking terrorist suspects uh, due to a guy who just left the special operations the day before and became, became a SAIC employee. They had control over the robots scouring the uh, pile at ground zero. These robots had been used for destroying expo uh, unexploded ordnance in the past. And SAIC profited greatly from 9-11. Dwayne Andrews himself had expert knowledge of the systems and their vulnerabilities that failed on 9-11. And of course, he was uh, Dick Cheney's protege. My, General Michael Canavan was in the position that, if you believe the official story, was the real reason that the air defenses failed. And that is, he was the hijack coordinator on 9-11 for the FAA. Uh, the most important link between NORAD and the FAA. According to the official story, that's what happened. The FAA couldn't communicate with NORAD. He was missing on 9-11, just happened to be missing. Didn't appoint anybody to take his job. He started the job just nine months before 9-11 and left just a month later. Uh, he had several suspicious uh, activities related to his job prior to leaving, including gross negligence, according to some of the people involved and reducing fines for airlines uh, related to security. Um, he was formerly the commander of the US Joint Special Operations Command. So that's kind of unusual for somebody to lead the entire Special Operations Command and then take a civilian job just for a short period of time as the FAA's uh, hijack coordinator. He is mentioned in the 9-11 Commission report for that Joint Special Operations Command job, but not at all for his hijack coordinator position. Donald Rumsfeld was most responsible for the failure of defense on 9-11, the Secretary of Defense. He failed to do anything at all. He was in charge at the Pentagon, but again, another person who just went missing. He went out for a stroll in the parking lot in the lawn and had a very unusual response when asked about that, which I won't go into. His longtime business partner, Peter Jansen, managed Amec Construction, the company that had just finished the $258 million refurbishment of the exact spot where Flight 77 hit that building, and then was hired to clean up that spot and the World Trade Center. Peter Jansen's another suspect in my book. Uh, so, you know, on and on, um, tried to prevent the investigations. Let's go into the air defense failures. Ralph Eberhardt was Donald Rumsfeld's uh, subordinate. He was uh, in charge of NORAD. He was also in charge of the space agency. At, uh, in that Latin, uh, former role, he set the levels for something called Infocon, which is the security guidelines for communication systems across the, the military in, in Washington. So he set them 
Uh, and just hours before the 9-11 attacks, they were set at their lowest level, which means they were most vulnerable. As chief in charge of uh, NORAD, he was in charge of many of the highly coincidental military exercises, like Vigilant Guardian, that seemed to be mimicking the attacks and definitely were disrupting the responses. He failed to implement military control over the US airspace, which is basically what people would have thought he would do. In the middle of the attacks, he tied it decided to take a leisurely drive from uh, Cheyenne Mountain Operations Center to Peterson Air Force Base for about an hour. So he went missing too. He gave orders that obstructed the interceptors. He failed to cooperate with the investigations. And if you have believed the official story, he lied to Congress. That's where my record from Indiana University came in very handily. He said that they had notification of several of these planes documented notification in NORAD, and that is not the official account. The official account says they did not get notification of these hijackings. So, you know, lying to Congress is usually a crime, but perhaps not in this case. Richard Clark is known as kind of a hero in 9-11 for apologizing to the 9-11 families. But Richard Clark um, is a very suspicious character, not the least of which he is very closely related to the leaders of the United Arab Emirates, which, which are the owners of the, the terrorist network BCCI. You may remember BCCI as a terrorist bank, and it was actually a CIA-controlled uh, network of, of uh, banks. Um, he actually tipped off his friends in the Emirates who were hunting with Osama bin Laden on a couple of occasions when the CIA had plans to capture bin Laden. So he tipped them off and allowed bin Laden to escape. This is a matter of public record. When C Congressman Richard Burr questioned him and what was secret testimony for a while, um, he basically admitted it. He failed to take action against al-Qaeda cells within the US, basically promoting the myth with you know, bin Laden alive and al-Qaeda al cells going on. That kind of builds the myth of 9-11. He was in charge at the White House Situation Room on 9-11. There, therefore, he was in charge of the air defense threat calls that failed. He was a member, long-time member, two 20-year member of a small secret uh, continuity of government team with George H.W. Bush, Dick Cheney, James Woolsey, and Donald Rumsfeld, as, long as, as well as one guy, Kenneth Duberstein, that doesn't get mentioned very often. Kenneth Duberstein was also a COG member and a, a senior executive for Boeing. And Dick, uh, Richard Clark activated COG for the first time on 9-11. This is one of my suspects who actually has acknowledged the fact that I've named him a su suspect and put my article on him on his website. This is Brian Michael Jenkins, probably the, one of the world's leading experts on terrorism. He was the deputy chairman of Crow at a time when the entire security system for the World Trade Center was redesigned by that company. And for the first few years, as Stratistec tried, started to implement that new security system. And he evaluated the possibility of airliner crashes into the World Trade Center, despite the contradictory statements made, made by uh, Condoleezza Rice and others. Um, longtime special operations officer, he led uh, a lot of terrorism pro propaganda. He was a member of Aviation Security Commissions and so forth. And another reason I really think he's a suspect is he has been accused of terrorism himself in Central America against civilian populations and infrastructure by um, the Humanist magazine. It's a, it's a pretty well-known magazine back in 1993. This guy doesn't have a picture. He's that secret kind of a guy. This is the guy who a long time, for a long time was uh, um, said to be a cousin of George Bush, and, and uh, it's kind of an irrelevant question because uh, he was the CEO of Stratisec, where Marvin Bush was a board member. Uh, he has a long family history of links to covert operations. His father was a CIA officer and DIA officer. His forefather, James Monroe Walker, was the uh, manager for Russell and Company when they invested all their opium war funds in the U.S. This man was flagged by the Securities and Exchange Commission for 9-11 insider trading, he and his wife. Never investigated by the FBI or the 9-11 Commission. Not even interviewed by them. 
he operated aviation companies as well, and they just happened to be located in the exact small area of a small airport in Oklahoma City that is now occupied by the guy who trained Zacharias Misawa. Seems suspicious, I don't know. Uh, he now works with people who all have top secret clearances. This is his chief operating officer, Barry McDaniel. And again, they had the most access, the mo they had the ability to give access to people to anywhere in the World Trade Center complex and, and also deny access. So if you wanna talk about how could explosives be placed in the buildings, if you can give access and deny access to whoever you want, you should be a suspect in that. Uh, I've mentioned Dulles uh, CCTV because of, of the, all the airports, you would think they would have security cameras. They didn't. They didn't at least they didn't have these, these guys boarding these planes. They didn't have, after 9-11, and, and a couple of years later, one of these videos appeared, just one. It came from Dulles. Uh, it was a uh, no date, no time stamp on the, on the video. It shows some of these guys coming through being scanned by what looks like one of Rudy Giuliani's bodyguards, right? The big, big guy. Uh, but this is the exact same system that Stratisec managed. That's just a curious point, I think. The only video of these guys boarding planes on 9-11, the only video came from a system managed by Stratisec. He was a military ordnance logistics expert. He was the uh, director of the U.S. Army material readiness and, and distributed uh, explosives and other ordnance around the world uh, in the 1980s at the time of the Iran-Contra crimes. Um, due to his association with Frank Carlucci, he was associated with several other covert companies um, that they both worked for. After 9-11, he started a defense and, and police state equipment company with Dick Cheney's old partner, Bruce Bradley. Dick Cheney worked for a company called Bradley Wood on and off in his Nixon Ford administration days. That's Bradley, uh, Bruce Bradley is Bradley Wood, and here we are with Barry McDaniel uh, doing business now with Dick Cheney's old partner. So outlining a case is my second part of this, right? So we're, we're just beginning this. We're naming suspects. We're trying to outline a case. I am, and I think you can help. But the way it's starting to shape up uh, with these 19 suspects is these, these accused men built a myth uh, by supporting the accused, the alleged hijackers. Richard Clark and George Tennant, the CIA director, and Louis Free, the FBI director. Richard Armitage, the deputy Sec secretary of state. These other guys facilitated the hijacking or even the facility of the remote hijacking. General Michael Canavan uh, named a Secret Service operative, uh, some airport security people. These people disrupted the chain of command and communications, Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld, the Secret Service, and Dwayne Andrews. These guys disrupted the air defenses on 9-11, Ralph Eber Eberhardt, without question, Michael Canavan. Benedict Sliney was the National Operations Manager for the FAA who miraculously was on his first day on the job, and they gave him control of the response. These people facilitated the destruction of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. I talk about Brian Michael Jenkins, Wirt, Wirt Walker, Barry McDaniel, Rudy Giuliani, Paul Bremer, Peter Jansen, Paul Wolfowitz, and Dwayne Andrews. So, we are outlining a case, we're building a case here we need to bring a case to court. This is a tough part, but we're much closer when we built a case. We've got a lot of reliable evidence that we can explain that's much better at explaining what happened that shouldn't have happened and what didn't happen that should have happened than these 19 guys who couldn't fly Cessnas, right? These guys are much closer to the truth. How do we bring a case to court? We've tried a lot. Uh, I've been involved in trying with my former company. One thing we can do is take smaller, maybe, maybe make smaller uh, initiatives that can lead to what's called discovery, legal discovery, so we can build more evidence and uh, have a stronger case. There's something called the False Claims Act that could be pursued potentially. It has been pursued um, not so well in the past. The NIST Data Quality Act is, an, is a legal action that still needs to be further pursued. 
But I really believe uh, inter there needs to be a project to really go through international or foreign country possibilities because there are 57 countries that had citizens die in 9-11. I know that Richard's been to Malaysia when they did a war crimes tribunal. Some of us have, uh, have had a petition to the Canadian government. But that's only two. There's 50, 55 more countries. Let's, I think we should look at what possibilities there are there. This is the toughest spot, bringing the case to court. But, um, you know, as time passes, I think there's more possibilities. Um, today we talked about maybe moving towards uh, encouraging more uh, congressmen and, and other government leaders to support us, so that might help. But if we could just work on all these steps, instead of just calling for another investigation, I really believe if we, uh, as citizen act activists, conduct some of the investigation, we're gonna be closer to achieving 9-11 truth and justice. And that's basically my message today, so thank you very much. Mr. Kevin Ryan, he's one of a kind.